Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're in open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And tonight, we're so lucky to have with us for the whole hour uh, Dr. Stephen Eric Bronner, who is one of the leading political thinkers in the world. Uh, he's also a prolific author and a political philosopher and a distinguished professor of political science, comparative literature, and Germanic studies at Rutgers University. We're, we're in his lovely Fortley home, his wife Annie here, been so uh, engaging us in dialogue now for almost about an hour, sitting here sipping coffee and eating cookies, and uh, is sort of we're, we're exemplifying what <coughs> a term that, that Mr. Bronner has basically invented, which is known as the cosmopolitan sensibility. So we're going to kind of start with that because we have so many problems in our world today, politics, inequality of wealth, but if only people would start to come together, we're trying to use our show as a vehicle to, to create community and dialogue and discourse and uh, through the arts and through politics. And Stephen, your work uh, in critical theory, you're one of the leading experts on critical theory in the world. Uh, maybe we can get into that as well. What is critical theory? And if we can talk about it in a way that's uh, not so difficult to understand, because notoriously some academics have a very difficult time explaining this in a way that, you know, regular folks and even intelligent, you know, everyday people and even educated people can understand it. What is critical theory? What is a cosmopolitan sensibility? Mm -hmm. This idea of urban urban living. Claudia and I live in Hoboken. We have lots of cafes. And how much does it have to do with the cafe life? How much does it have to do with having free time? How much does it have to do with having a liberal arts education? Uh, so why don't we start with that? What is a cosmopolitan sensibility, sir? Well, you know, it used to be the case that the that the left was uh, committed to internationalism, and there were various institutions uh, that united the labor movement, and the institutions were were very weak. But the commitment to to sort of an international solidarity was relatively strong. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a situation where we have international institutions uh, that, uh, or transnational institutions, some of which are very strong, like the European Union, but the commitment to them is very weak. And I, th I think the, um, one of the most important things that, uh, for education is to move out of one's own ghetto. And uh, Kant once, de once described cosmopolitanism mm -hmm. as the ability to feel at home everywhere. Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher. The great philosopher, the philosopher. philosopher yeah. right. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's also that one should try and make a home for different uh, cultures mm -hmm. and actually really get, in, get into the culture. You know, our idea of uh, multiculturalism mm -hmm is it's actually quite unfortunate i think it, uh, it's very provincial what we want to do is find our own roots and we don't we're not uh, we lack interest in the roots of others you know so to me what uh, the the project that remains to be undertaken in terms of pedagogy and also in terms of uh, of actual practice is to foster in young people a kind of se um, sensibility, a curiosity, an openness mm. to different cultures and a willingness to employ the cultures. Let me, uh, let me give you an example um, that's sort of concrete. Uh, there were two great painters before World War I uh, Paul Clay and uh, August Macke. They were very famous uh, expressionists. And they decided, as did many avant-gardists at the time, uh, to go to Tunisia. 
uh, well, all uh, I meant the avant-gardists went to Africa, to Mexico, to places which they considered exotic. Mm. And um, uh, Clay and Maka cho uh, chose Tunisia. And so they went to Tunisia and they found this incredible light mm. which they brought into their painting. And they painted their uh, 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 many watercolors, but other things too. Mm -hmm. They uh, and they used, of course, the scenery and the landscapes and so on of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. So they come back to Munich, put on an exhibition. It's a sensation. Mm -hmm. it, ca it came to be known as the Tunisian Light Exhibition. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know, it, it, if one were to look at that today, I think one would find. Mm -hmm. It's neither really European, mm -hmm. nor is it really African. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of a, a healthy combination of both that goes beyond each of the particular oh. cultures, and that's I think the kind of thing we should strive for. Um, yes. an, another example would be um, if one thinks of um, the great uh, Persian poet. Mm. Hafez. Mm. He wrote a poem called The Divan. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is uh, cherished in Iran. Mm. Um, uh, kids still go out on dates and they oh. read the poem, uh, his poems to one another as love poems. We, uh, my wife and I uh, witnessed that um, around his house. Mm. When, he, when uh, Hafez was writing, uh, well, Hafez wrote The Divan, and the great uh, cosmopolitan writer, uh, Johann Goethe, oh. in, in uh, Germany, was so struck by this, and he had, uh, he had someone help him with translation. He was so struck by the poem, he wrote The West East Divan. And I think you can actually say that with Goethe, the idea of world literature begins. Um, oh, yes, yes. You know, learning other languages. I mean, it's appalling how in, in, uh, in the United States nobody knows any other languages. Yes, yes. Yeah. And we, but of course we expect everyone to speak English. Wow. Right? Wow. Yeah, I think so. At any rate, uh, so the cosmopolitan sensibility is just that. It's a mm -hmm. sensibility. It's not a set of categories. Mm -hmm. It's not a set of institutions. Uh, it's not even mm -hmm. uh, political in the narrow sense. What it is is a mm -hmm. curiosity, a feeling that the world should be made bigger mm -hmm. and uh, that one's experience has to grow outside of one's own ghetto. If I had to do over again, uh, one thing I would do uh, as a young person, in the 60s, uh, I, traveled, I already traveled a lot. I always went to Europe. Oh. If I had to do over again, yeah. I would have been going to Africa or to, the, uh, or to Latin America much more than... Uh, um, rather than wait until I've got, I got older to do it. I, it changes one's outlook, you know? If one takes it seriously, and not just as a uh, sort of a tourist, but actually tries to get into the history and the culture mm. and the thinking of, uh, of mm. people in different uh, lands and uh, different upbringings. So that's basically it. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and um, you know, you talk about great German thinkers like Goethe. Uh, behind you on the bookshelf, there's another great German thinker, Karl Marx, and his volumes of Capital are right back there. And I'm just thinking about if we had a world in which had better wealth equality, that folks had more time to educate themselves. And I think that cosmopolitan sensibility is developed through a humanistic education, a liberal education, as you say. Sure. And also this idea that the other is embraced through a dialogue as, as an educator, myself, my students that we get always get in a circle, encourage that back and forth, that dialogue. My, one of my heroes is Martin Buber, 
who talks about the I and thou and that that, that type of uh, you know instead of you 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 embrace the other you accept the other you don't you, as a friend as a friend the stranger is brought in and and that's a segue to your recent book the bigot your new book is called The Bigot, Why Prejudice Persists. And I can't think of a more topical subject now uh, in the wake of uh, last year's events in Ferguson and, and in uh, Staten Island with the police overreach. And this idea that uh, bigotry is also rooted in a kind of uh, intolerance or a feeling that, that the right wing has also the fear that... So, so talk a little bit about The Bigot and what was your... Uh, basic thesis for this this book well yeah. first thing I think the cosmopolitan sensibility leads into this mm -hmm. because there's no better uh, antidote mm -hmm. to prejudice than cosmopolitanism seeing new things yeah. in the world and that's exactly what the bigot is afraid of mm. we've had uh, great books classic books written about racism about anti-Semitism, about sexism, what have you. But what was lacking, what I, uh, the reason I wanted to, uh, to write this book, was I think there's similar dynamics mm. to all of these different forms of prejudice. And The Bigot, or my, the bigot, my book, The Bigot, is an attempt to explore those. It's the, the, the right word really is it's a phenomenology of the bigot, of, of prejudice. But what that essentially means is that uh, the basic psychological, sociological, mm. political structures that find their way into every form of prejudice. Mm. Mm. That's, mm. Uh, that's it. Now, what's the per, uh, what inspired me was two, uh, with this was two or three different events. One was, um, you know, I teach at Rutgers, and there was a young man named Tyler Clementi. Mm. Tyler Clementi was a, a, a gay student, very naive. He was a music student. Mm. And uh, he had a meeting with some other uh, young man and in his room. Mm. And that meeting was filmed by his, secretly taped, but by his roommate mm. and put on, the, on uh, uh, the, um, YouTube. 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 Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Uh, a few days later, Tyler Clementi jumped off the George Washington Bridge. Mm. And uh, that somehow stuck with me. So did the torture and killing of Matthew Shepard oh. uh, a, uh, a while before. Mm. So that was one thing, and I thought, wow, this, this, I, I should really write about that. I've written about the Enlightenment and reclaiming mm -hmm. the Enlightenment. I've worked on critical theory, as you kindly mm -hmm. said, but I thought this was something that fit. Mm -hmm. And um, it's where the Enlightenment becomes important yeah. uh, in reacting against the bigot. Mm -hmm. In any event, mm -hmm. the other thing that... Uh, sort of inspired me to write it was uh, the circumstances around President Obama. First black president. First black president. Okay. And, you know, whatever your politics are, you can be critical of Obama, critical of Obama from the right, from the left, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. supportive of Obama. There's one thing I think that everybody would agree on at least in my uh, experience, I've never seen a president disrespected like this, mm, ever. Mm, across the board. Across yeah. the board. From the left and right. Yeah, yeah sure. but I mean, of course, particularly for, from the right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you go on the, uh, if you go on, on YouTube, mm -hmm. you, and you go around and see posters, and you, sure. you hear rallies, I'll give you just uh, yeah. one or two examples. Uh, imagine... Um, there is a set, uh, a set of chimpanzees, a little family, and the heads of Obama, uh, Obama and his family have put on that. Or uh, there's a picture of the White House lawn and um, the White House filled with, lo with watermelons. I mean, it, it, you know, there's a certain element to this which is beyond 
the normal criticism. And anyway, and that's uh, those two things. Uh, two things were particularly important for me in um, in doing this. I should also say I had done a book on anti-Semitism um, and conspiracy theory, and I thought to myself, it's time to move beyond that. You know, get uh, try and uh, and see what's new rather than what's uh, con uh, yeah. constant. And if the structures are the same, mm. in other words, the fear of modernity, the fear of the cosmopolitan, mm. uh, the uh, type of paranoia that, um, that the bigot always experiences, that his life is, his mm. life and his lifestyle is threatened, mm. and the kind of projection, mm. um, Simple, very simple example. If you think of Birth of a Nation, oh, right? W. Griffith. Exactly, yeah, yeah. the classic American mm -hmm. uh, film, mm -hmm. which is about, uh, it, which is a positive rendering of the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. One of the things that's uh, remarkable about the film is this is 1912. Uh, I think that's right. You see in the film this constant thing about uh, black men yeah. lusting after and raping Ooh. white, or trying to rape white women. But of course, especially after the, uh, during the uh, immediate aftermath of the Civil War and before in the South, it wasn't black men who were, rape, uh, who were raping white women. It was white men raping black women. Mm, mm. That is a that's called projection. Yeah. yeah. At any rate, uh, so given that these uh, that these structures are intact with mm. regard to bigotry, I think there's something new mm -hmm. on the agenda, and that is that racism is pursued without the old language mm. of racism. Mm. In other words, yeah, it's true. You see uh, sort of these Neanderthals around, and uh, I don't want to minimize the way they hurt people. But I don't think that's the cutting, uh, cutting edge, so to speak. Mm. I think it's different. I think the, the, the basis of, of uh, bigotry today mm -hmm. is that one carries out um, policies, Pol political policies and social policies and economic policies that target exactly the same old groups that were discriminated against, but now the language is different. So, for example, you think of cutting back um, economic support programs, education programs, public education programs. Those are going to hit Mm. Uh, black communities, particular uh, and Latino communities, particularly hard. I just want to interject that you know Bill Clinton had said he wanted to end welfare as we know it in 1996. So was there ramifications to that also? Or? Oh yeah, okay. I, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's not. I mean, it's not so much the the history of welfare that's mm -hmm. uh, welfare cuts and this. It's true, it moves beyond simply the Republican Party. Mm. But uh, what's interesting is the way the cuts are justified. We want to build responsibility. We want to build individualism. Mm -hmm. We want to, isn't it, nobody will come out and say, we want to disadvantage black people. Mm. You know? Same thing with regard to women. You think of cuts with planned Planned Parenthood and the like. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to say I'm anti-woman, right? But the policies that that are supported mm. are anti-woman. Gays and gay marriage. Well, it's not really gay. It's not that that they're gay. That we oppose gays. I mean, they're people too. Mm. But if we allow gay marriage. We destroy the sanctity of marriage, mm. and we uh, and it's an offense against religion. Mm. And you can keep going like this, 
And if you, there must be a reason why all the old groups that, that were discriminated against, traditional groups, women, Jews, people of color, uh, gays, there must be a reason why these are all, the majority of these groups, mm -hmm. all vote Democratic. I mean, it can't just be that they're misled, although right-wing uh, um, ideologues and Coulter, for example, mm. talks about women being brainwashed. Um, um, any number of, uh, of famous black conservatives around now will uh, say it's time for us to move out, to, out of the Democratic Party. Mm. But most people of color don't. And I think the reason is very simple. It's because the policies hmm. speak to them and help them. Uh, whereas the politics of the Republican Party don't. Another example, voting. Uh, there have been attempts to roll back the Civil Rights, uh, rights Act, the Voting Rights Bill, hmm. and to literally make through various forms of uh, identification and the like make it more difficult for poor and especially black and uh, Latinos uh, citizens to vote. Now, what's the, what's the justification? It's the same thing again. Uh, nobody's going to say we don't want them to vote. What they are going, what they are going to say is um, well, we want to protect against fraud, mm. voter fraud. Mm. Now, one of my friends, uh, mm -hmm. Lori Minetti, uh, is an expert on voter fraud. Mm. Uh, she teaches at Camden, in, in, uh, Rutgers Camden. at Rutgers Camden. Okay. Uh, she told me that there is a greater likelihood of me being hit by lightning mm. than... <laughs> Uh, than the discovery of voter fraud in an election. <laughs> I, which, I mean, basically says it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we were talking about less than po uh, point, what is it, less than 0.1% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with regard to fraud. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if you think of the election of President Bush, mm -hmm. if you think back, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm to what went on with uh, with the, the voting tallies and the like. Mm. But that's not what's meant. Mm. That's not what's brought into question. What's brought into question is, again, mm. uh, these uh, t traditionally targeted groups. And so lastly, I think, mm -hmm. the issue has always been, I think, um, that in the struggle for recognition, to overcome di uh, discrimination, I think the, it's always been a matter how do you foster uh, the empowerment of, a, of an oppressed group mm -hmm. without engaging in your own form of sectarianism or bigotry. Mm. And I think today there are actually new ways to think about this. One way to think about it is that these groups mm -hmm. Uh, that the division between these identity groups and the working class, which was traditional on the left, there's class and there's uh, uh, identity. Mm -hmm. I think that's over. Mm -hmm. uh, you think of what is the working class today. It's uh, women. Mm -hmm. It's um, people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, th this whole... Um, Vision of the of the white worker. Mm. This is not the way it is any longer, mm. and so it gives us a basis for talking about new forms of solidarity. Mm. And one way I think of expressing mm. that demand for solidarity is to call for the cosmopolitan sensibility. Ah. So back to where we started. Well, I want everyone who's watching us to realize that this is not a soundbite you're watching here. This is a substantive, detailed, complex 
explanation of a difficult political problem by one of the leading political philosophers in our world, and it's not every day that we get a Stephen Eric Bronner on our show, so we're very grateful to have you on our on our show, Stephen. And um, so as important as this problem of bigotry is today, I think it's also a symptom of a larger crisis in politics and crisis in education. Maybe we can get to that now. And also, why don't we kind of segue, if we can, into your own biography to see how a person of your intelligence has developed in terms of your your own cultivation as, as a model for others also to, you know, to develop that kind of critical intelligence. Uh, talk about your education. Um, okay, let me uh, first say I, I don't view myself as a model. I, and I think one of the reasons is that I know, looking back in my life, that a lot of the choices I made had an element of luck. I met the right people. I uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to wind up with the right teachers, mm. um, and that made a big difference. Uh -huh. Now, having said that, there are also elements, I guess, which are more open to uh, a more objective um, perspective. Mm. I, um, I came to sort of um, consciousness during the 60s. I was at uh, City College uh, of New York at that time, it was fabulous. And I came from um, uh, Washington Heights, which was a German exile com uh, community, German Jews. Mm -hmm. And the, how should I say, the concern with education, enlightenment values, mm -hmm. even socialism in a certain way, oh. uh, yeah, because many of it, many people were on the uh, uh, were social democrats in um, in my com when they were in Germany, and um, also a, sort of a basic concern with I don't know b a bigotry if you like. Mm. Uh, a lot of this came out uh, of I think of the uh, world I grew up in. I spoke German before I spoke English. Uh, although I was born here, um, huh. because at that time in Washington Heights, Ger everybody was a, a German Jew, and yeah. you spoke German in the street. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I sort of imbibed that, and I took it seriously. Many people turned away because mm. uh, Germany was identified with Hitler and with evil. Mm. Uh, those who really suffered, I... There's nothing much you can say about that. Mm. But for people, for younger people, mm -hmm. it's another matter. It's like, open your eyes. Uh, mm. In any event. Mm. So uh, I was sort of uh, lucky enough to learn German as, as a kid. So I, w I wound up uh, in two, growing up in two, two languages that I was fluent in. Mm. And two cultures that, uh, that I came to know relatively well. In the 60s, uh, I wound up um, as one member of, uh, of the movement. Mm -hmm. And so that created a context in which the politics, I don't know, uh, was recognized by other people. You may have talked about it on, over the uh, dinner table or with a few of your friends, but it wasn't recognized as such. I mean, growing up, you know, the 50s and the early 60s was not exactly uh, a political picnic. Um, <laughs> Eisenhower playing golf, you know, yeah. wasn't really... And if you okay. were into the civil rights movement, okay. that's another matter. <laughs> okay. But, um, if, you know, in, in, the, in the broader, in uh, the broader uh, sphere, I mean, this was, as I say, uh, not a picnic. Uh, and at City College, I was lucky enough to meet... Um, Henry Pactor. Um, Henry Pactor was a, uh, he's, not, he's sort of forgotten today. Mm -hmm. um, he was a socialist, uh, he was a communist in the 20s in Germany. Mm -hmm. He was a socialist uh, after he was kicked out of the Communist Party. He fought in the resistance 
and uh, then came here, did some work with the OSS, which was the mm. f- forerunner of the CIA, uh, composed mostly of leftists against oh, the world. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and they worked against the fascists, uh, you know, the fascists oh. in the war. Right, right, right. So, and, and at any rate, this is, you know, when Henry spoke, even rambunctious rebels, you know, you shut up and you listen. <laughs> uh, and there were a number of, of people like that uh, that we that I ran into uh, mm-hmm. at that time. Hans Morgenthau and uh, Richard Lowenthal. I, I mean, they weren't always the easiest people to deal with, but uh, if one was curious, yes. they were just absolutely unbelievable. Mm. As, te- as teachers, these were intellectuals who uh, knew everything. Hans Morgenthau basically founded international relations uh. in the United States. Uh. You know, but he taught courses on Aristotle. Um, uh, Pachter uh, is from Henry Pachter, who really uh, worked on socialist politics. Then he learned critical theory originally. Um, at any rate, uh, the the this created sort of a pedagogic concept mm. text as well as a social one, mm-hmm. and so uh, I was hooked. <laughs> and then I wound up going to Berkeley, which uh, I have to say I have very mixed feelings about. Uh, yeah, it it was very good in terms of legitimating me to get a job. Okay. Um, because it, it really was a terrific university. Mm. I thought City College was much better. Ah. But that's me. Uh, at that time, there was hardly a soul who even knew what critical theory was. Mm. And uh, so... Can I just interject with a very quick mm-hmm. story, uh, Stephen? I was actually at City College on 137th Street the other day because, you know, it's got such a great history, and I wanted to... I'm, I'm teaching at Bariqua College, which is up in Washington Heights, your old neighborhood now, and it's not too far away from City College. So I wanted right. to wander in there, and I was curious of whether those old cafeteria alcoves were still there because they had these right. famous cafeteria with alcove one, alcove two, where these incredible, you know, New York intellectuals would discuss the world as they said, argue the world, argue the world. Irving Howe and those guys and, and I was asking like the security guard and nobody knew like where these cafeterias are and it's kind of a thing of the past but yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 it is the past I and mean, it's a new period uh-huh. but at that time it was still known as the proletarian Harvard oh, yeah that's, that. um, okay. yeah. Um, but anyway so I wound up yeah. going to Berkeley I, I can't say I had uh, the students were great. I mean, the community was great. But I can't say that there were people I really gravitated well, towards. Mario Savio, was he there? That was really before my time. I'd met him a few times. Okay. But uh, uh, he was older. And um, mm-hmm. I was oh. born in 1949. So uh, I was sort of uh, the runt of the litter, so to speak, when he speaks about the 60s. Oh. Um, yeah, I was a young guy and sort of tagged along with different, uh, different people. And I, did you go to Woodstock? I, I got caught in the mud. Oh, you did? Uh, I did. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Uh, but I was lucky enough during uh, the Columbia uh, oh. student uprising to meet Paul Goodman. And uh, uh, Goodman was an anarchist. Uh, yeah. But he was a really profound guy um a really thoughtful profound guy he wrote growing up absurd growing up absurd that's yeah, right yeah, yeah, which yeah. was a tremendous hit a hit yeah, yeah. and uh it created a new vision of education you know uh, everybody today you know you think back on pablo Fre- uh, paulo freire paulo freire yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I never say it right. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the great, uh, yes. the great Latin American uh, educator, uh, who is a great American yeah. uh, Latin American educator. But there's also we have somebody closer to home. We have Paul Goodman as well. 
Mm. Yeah. Do you think Bill Gates read Paul Goodman? Because they're pushing the corporate charter school movement, and I don't know if they're aware of these people, Steve. Yeah. Do you think they might be or not? I don't know. Okay. That, uh, Bill possible. Gates, if you're watching, read Paul Goodman and read Stephen Eric Braun. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. At any rate, so I had, I had from the beginning sort of a certain, you know, Henry Pactor was a mm-hmm. socialist, a realist, uh, very hard-headed, mm-hmm. very into the logic of power. And Goodman was more idealistic, more communitarian, mm-hmm. more open-ended. Uh, he was an American mm-hmm. radical, I guess. Uh, and at Berkeley, at any rate, um, I, I, the reputation school did help, and I wound up with, uh, with a Fulbright, and I wound up in Germany. And there I had the uh, a pleasure of um, taking courses with Ernst Bloch, <gasps> Who was the the Ernst Bloch? Uh, who you the, dedicate your book on critical theory to? That's right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bloch was um, eighty nine, I think. I think that's right. Eighty eight or eighty nine when I uh, took his classes, and he is the great philosopher of utopia, and the great philosopher of hope. Oh. And interestingly enough, I mean, uh, and maybe your audience uh, yeah. would like this, you know, because the theme has been the cosmopolitan sensibility. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd been at City College. I'd been at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Uh, at City College, I took relatively straight courses. Berkeley was supposed to be the mm-hmm. cosmopolitan, open-ended thing. Mm-hmm. When I got to Tübingen, Bloch did a course in which he taught people like Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Verroes, Plotinus. This was North African. Uh, these were all North African thinkers. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I had never heard of these guys. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I mean, it, you know, this was like, wow. <laughs> Bloch, of course, knew this stuff inside out uh, and employed it in his own thought, actually. Um, and... So th- this is a, a great example of the cosmopolitan sensibility. Whatever one wants to say yes, about yes. Ernst Bloch, and he made his political mistakes, and uh, uh, there's metaphysical side to him, which is difficult to, to swallow. But nonetheless, uh, uh, and this goes alongside a remarkable theoretical uh, moves and so on. There was an erudition and a kind of um, effervescence, intellectual effervescence, mm-hmm. which was really something. Mm-hmm. So I wound up with um, sort of uh, an idealist, utopian mm-hmm. part of my personality and mm-hmm. on the other hand a very um, a committed concern to Socialism to uh, kind of realism, pragmatic to, politics, pragmatic politics, and so over the years, um, I tried to, in a certain way, fuse that. Yeah, I don't know how successfully, but I tried to fuse that, and critical theory gave me an avenue uh, to do that, um, a particular avenue. And over the years, I, I kept my interests in culture, um, an interdisciplinary outlook. Uh, in fact, I recently did a book called Modernism at the Barricades, oh. which is about the modernist movement um, and the great avant-garde. Picasso. And- yeah, Diego yeah. Rivera and uh, the Russian futurist. These, mm. uh, these were intimately bound up with the mm. politics of the day. Mm. And I tried to resolve some of the contradictions and some of the problems between this idealism on the one hand and realism on the other. Mm. And I think one of the things that, on, that happens on the left today is we don't face both sides of the coin. Mm. Mm. On the one hand, we have, uh, you know, imaginative and brave young people in, uh, in Zuccotti Park and Occupy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm talking now about the activists, uh, the, the core activists mm-hmm. and thinkers, seeking to really transform politics, build a new participatory democracy and the like. 
without any sense of the pragmatic mm -hmm. uh, realities mm -hmm. of the political world. And actually, if you think of Occupy, what it really did, in my view, was three things. Okay. It knocked uh, the Tea Party off the front pages. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. It created a new sense of uh, a new uh, a concern with the 99% as mm -hmm. against the 1%, mm -hmm. and it sort of uh, let, uh, gave people the inspiration that they could do something mm -hmm. once again, mm -hmm. that they could react against what was growing, uh, the kind of uh, cultural reaction that was sweeping America. Those are very pragmatic things. On the other hand, they required a certain utopian mm, element to mm, get to get them moving, mm. and this had always interested me. Um, then, so I'd started out studying socialism, studying uh, the labor movement, got into critical theory, mm -hmm. uh, and especially the cultural aspects of uh, resistance. And then finally, um, I wound up um, as working with, I'd always maintained a certain activism, but I wound up as um, connected with U.S. Academics for Peace, mm -hmm. which I'm the executive director of now, mm -hmm. and Conscience International. I became very interested in human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wound up... Uh, approaching human rights in a realistic way. Uh, I, th I like to think a realistic way. And um, I try to engage in, th in practice as well as theories through mm. what, what's called often second track diplomacy or civic diplomacy. Mm. And I was lucky enough to be in Iraq before the war, just before the war, mm -hmm. about a month before the war actually. Mm. Um, and I've been able to, uh, I've been to Darfur uh, a few times, and uh, I've been able to meet with different politicians as well as uh, civil society people in uh, Syria. We met uh, Assad, uh, President Assad, and um, we traveled in the West Bank, um, I, it, it, my world has grown bigger mm. as I've uh, as I've developed, and that was, I think, part of the the appeal of the activism. Mm. Mm. They would allow me to meet people I, I never would have met before. As one of the leading political thinkers in our country, do you think that the political ruling class in America takes you as seriously as they might? <laughs> that, of course, is a very difficult question to answer. Now, of course, if... Um, I mean, as a potential uh, advisor, let's say, or... Oh, uh, no. Consultant. Basic. Uh, ba uh, well, it's very kind of you, the way you, uh, the way you describe me. They don't care about a utopian vision, is what you're saying. They don't well, that's care for about sure. They political ideas. Okay. And, and this, uh, you know, and this has, I think, a political consequence. Hmm. Because if you think of every great movement, everyone, whether you're talking about uh, the civil rights movement or you're talking about the communist movement or you're talking about the, the fascist movement uh, or you're talking about ISIS, mm -hmm. each of those movements has a, has a utopian component to its ideology. And if we don't take that seriously and have somebody to analyze it, uh, we're not going to know what's going on. That was also true of, of Vietnam. Mm, mm. Um, we didn't understand the ideological motivations for uh, the Viet Cong. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And anyway, that's, that's one of the things I'm interested in doing. 
I want to say something about the fact that we're in Fort Lee, New Jersey, which was the original Hollywood. Before there was a Hollywood, Fort Lee, New Jersey was where they filmed Perils of Pauline. That's right. It's where my grandmother lived, who was brought to America by a famous actress. I've mentioned this before on the show. She worked in the early film industry. She was an extra. There's actually uh, a hotel called Rambo's Hotel, which was around at the time. It's the last remaining structure from the early film days, which the, uh, the Fort Lee Preservation Committee managed to save that and you could watch old Charlie Chaplin films and see that hotel right? right so you write about the culture industry which is also a topic of critical theory and the fact that Hollywood acts as a propaganda a function in terms of you know tamping down one's hopes or it's it's hard to have a sense of agency where you can really you know yeah. change the world if you just watch hollywood films however there are some hollywood films and i'm going to give you an example of one of my favorite films bullworth starring warren Beatty, oh, which is a very radical film about a guy who's running for president and then he has this crisis of confidence he's in a black church and he has a epiphany and uh the radical uh poet uh, amiri baraka plays a cameo in that movie and a movie like reds so where, where do you see hollywood in terms of the role people watching television today and lots of fluffy stuff not our show obviously oh, yeah <laughs> but a lot those other channels you know we don't want to mention any names but anyway what what role does does Hollywood and television play and could that also be a space of intervention um, it's a very complex uh, uh, concept actually mm. Uh, basically, the answer, my answer to your question would be yes. Uh, my old collaborator and old friend, um, uh, Douglas Kellner, um, who was really one of the great interpreters of critical theory, um, he once described uh, the, uh, the cultural landscape and the culture industry as what he called the contested terrain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. Uh, the culture industry, in my view, it's not simply is not simply obsessed with politics. It's obsessed with making money, and if it can make make money from the left, it'll go left. Mm -hmm. Think of, uh, I mean, a great uh, show um, for progressives, All in the Family. All in the Family. Oh, yeah. Claudia and I, we've been watching that show. They have reruns. Oh, yeah. And yeah, Claudia, yeah. who's from Columbia, she's my lovely wife right. who's filming us right yeah. now. She's from Bogota, a little town outside Bogota. So she's watching these shows for the first time. Oh, my God. And you're God. getting a hilarious uh, program, but it's also very uh, critical as well. You're getting issues that are coming up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, these were... The writers and uh, mm -hmm. the, the people involved in this were obviously, you know, just top-rate mm. uh, people, and they brought important, relevant issues issues to bear, not mm. just, you know, um, sentiments, mm. Uh, mm. you know. And mm -hmm. in any event, I, I think uh, I think a word should be said about what the culture industry is. Yeah, yeah. It used to be the case that art. What, what had sort of a separate realm from reality. Mm. It was religious. It was supposed to inspire uh, uh, transcendent feelings, romanticism, and the like. Anyway, it had a, if I almost, you can say a deeper truth, a mm. deeper, uh, um, a deeper insight into reality than and a special insight into reality. Mm. That's what the claim is with the culture industry, is the following. If capitalism is understood as the expansion of what might be termed the commodity form, in other words, everything's treated as a commodity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what happens is that art starts to be treated as, a, and culture oh. starts to be treated as a commodity as well. Mm. So. When somebody is trying to do a film, it's a matter of a cost-benefit analysis, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. that'll, that has a lot to do, do with determining who gets what mm. and who appears where and the like. Mm. Um, now, 
the critical, uh, the Frankfurt School, people like Theodore Adorno and Herbert Marcuse mm -hmm. and Max Horkheimer, they they felt that this was that this development also had um, ramifications for the ability of people to think. And the reason is very simple. Yeah. They, in their view, uh, if you want to make the most money on a, on, an, on a cultural work, you want it to appeal to the broadest audience, mm. right? Mm. And if it's appealed to the broadest audience, the level sinks. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That would be true on the left, and it would be true <laughs> on the right. It doesn't matter what the, what the mm. thing is. Mm -hmm. It's going to be one of the, it, it, that's going to happen. Uh -huh. And so people get used to a certain way of thinking simplistically. Mm -hmm. Thinking not abstractly, not mm -hmm. critically, mm -hmm. not in utopian terms, but in the barest simple mm -hmm. uh, yes. categories. And this is a this is a real problem. I mean, it's a problem on the left as well as on the right. Mm -hmm. There's a contested terrain. The culture industry. Uh, I mean, the people who simply condemn the culture industry. It's ridiculous. Any movement mm -hmm. that emerges is going to have to deal with TV. It's going to have to deal with films. It's going to have to deal with music, and the like. No question. But at the same time. One of the things that uh, resistance to the status quo involves is w raising what Marx called the material level of culture. Mm. And what that means is we've got to be able to deal with complex issues mm. and not simply say, well, I don't understand them, therefore they don't exist. Uh, yeah, or yeah. say, well, you know, let somebody else deal with that. I'm a real, you know, I'm a serious guy. I'm a street guy. Mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with this guy. I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Usually the street guy has no clue what was going on because <laughs> if he did have a clue what was going on, he wouldn't be in the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But a lot of the working class folks now, they're watching Fox News, and it just came out that Bill O'Reilly, they did a fact check on him, and they found out that he's been actually lying about things like he said he was in the Falklands War he wasn't there there's a whole list of things this just came out I think in New York magazine it was an article mm -hmm. in the New Yorker I think it was that but as he continues to lie his ratings are going up which is very very strange you know so that and also you know uh, Theodore Adorno who you mentioned uh, one time he famously said every time I go to the movies he says I o it always makes me worse you know <laughs> But apparently he actually amended that later in life, where he sort of, I'm not sure what he, did he, did he change his mind on that? Or? Well, okay. he did amend it and tried to talk about it. But the reality of it, of it is the Frankfurt School, nobody in the Frankfurt School dealt with, uh, with mass dismissed, culture. Yeah, even in his more, so shall we say, open phase, <laughs> uh, he never he never analyzed anything of mass culture. I mean, the idea of Adorno uh, sitting and watching all in the family is incomprehensible. Yeah, uh, uh, he. Uh, 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 but let me be fair. Yeah. He did uh, write pieces on astrology, on some of this kind of stuff. And this is, uh, Adorno is one of the great minds of civilization. I want to ask you, this is sort of a, a kind of a, a little salacious uh, thing, but it's interesting that one of his students took her top off in class. This was back in the 60s. What, what was going on there? Well, you really do get to the, uh, the stuff. We want our ratings to go up a little bit. That's... One, of the, one of the ironies about... Um, this is true of Horkheimer also. Horkheimer and Adorno, not Herbert Marcuse, who was a figure of the left. Mm -hmm. uh, they, of course, escaped um, Hitler. They came here. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, they went back to Germany. And they were very celebrated. Mm -hmm. They weren't celebrated before the war. Mm -hmm. But it's as if Germany was desperate for uh, legitimation. And so they brought uh, 
Horkheimer and Adorno over. Horkheimer became the rector of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Adorno became the dean. But they still taught, okay. and they still kept their commitment to their philosophical approach, the emphasis upon resistance, no, that the, so and the culture industry. And their students wound up taking up these ideas uh, for the student movement. Okay. The result of that was that as Adorno and, and Horkheimer became more conservative politically, the students became more radical. Uh, and those those girls who took off their uh, their tops, they would uh, to basically say, "Look, you know, you can talk about liberation, but you can't really deal with it." Real liberation. Yeah. Oh, okay. And afterwards, Adorno died. He had a heart attack oh, uh, shortly thereafter. Very sad. That's very, very, very sad. sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great uh, yeah. tragedy. But uh, the, these thinkers, it's uh, it's important to keep their legacy alive in a practical way. Not just in terms of metaphysics, not just the esoteric discussions of uh, of uh, their texts, but trying to figure out how this stuff is applicable mm. to the great questions of our time. Well, and you're doing that more than anybody, uh, Professor uh, Bronner. Uh, we're here uh, with uh, Stephen Bronner, a uh, distinguished professor at Rutgers University, one of the leading political thinkers of our time. I like to see this as the beginning of a dialogue, Stephen. I hope you can come back uh, many times. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>